the Senior Vice President for Global Business Development for uh, Lockheed Martin out of our corporate office. I want to welcome all of you here this morning. Uh, thanks for taking the time. We very much appreciate it. Um, we're going to, uh, as um, Johan mentioned, we're going to walk through our vision of what we see the 21st century looking like um, in security and defense around the world. And you're going to hear from a number of our senior leaders across the business areas in Lockheed Martin tell you from their perspective what that vision looks like and, and what it'll mean. So I'm going to begin with just a little bit of an introduction. Let's go to the next slide, please. So I'm not going to dwell here, but just to say, I think you know all of you are probably aware of what the threats out there are driving for us, and particularly what they're driving in terms of technology. And technology for us is is the underpinning. It's the tool. It's the it's the things that we use to get to where we need to be for the defense of nations. Uh, but they're critically important, and, and I won't dwell certainly on, on directed energy or hypersonics, which tends to be two emerging key technologies that, um, that we're applying both uh, particularly in the, in the defensive realm, but hypersonics in the offensive realm as well. But particularly, you're going to hear more about those three on the right and that one on the bottom on the left, uh, autonomy, artificial learning, cyber EW, and 5G, and, and what that means, again, in context of our, our broader uh, set of offerings within Lockheed Martin. Next chart, please. So just a, a quick note on, on what we mean by network-centric centric security. Uh, fundamentally, this means uh, a discussion around not individual platforms. And, and when I say platforms, I mean not individual aircraft or ships or <coughs> missile systems. But how does the, the whole of all of those systems come together in a way that is, that is synergistic and allows a nation to apply everything at its disposal for its defense, not just an individual system, one at a time. Um, you, you know, one of the things I, I try and refer back to is, is some of the common world examples that you're all aware of. So let me just use a quick example for you, because sometimes we throw these words, about, these words artificial intelligence and net-centric and all around as though there's a common understanding of it. But I would say, you, you have a pretty common understanding. You probably have it in your pocket, in your, in your uh, iPhone or, or uh, whatever particular brand of, of um, a phone you're carrying around. But I would suggest you, the, the corollary here is consider what you do every day. Uh, you are a passive user of information from around the world from thousands of different sources. Uh, whether you look at your weather, which it comes from satellites and from radars and from infrared systems around the world to uh, navigation and maps, which comes from multiple places around the world, uh, to uh, your internet, any internet search you do. But it's all a very passive system, but it's all incredibly powerful. The, the, the information of the world is at your fingertips. Well, you can imagine now what you need in defense space. You need something a little bit different. So let me go to the corollary. Instead of me trying to figure out, it's time to go to dinner as a traveler. Where am I going to go? How am I going to get there? Who am I going to go with? Imagine if this passive device you have in your pocket did it all for you. It followed your habits. It, it looked at what you have done in the last months and years. It knew where you probably, what kind of dinner you probably wanted to have tonight based on what you had in the last week. It probably knows you want to walk instead of drive. It's going to look at the weather. Maybe it's going to call you an Uber because it knows already that that's what you're going to use in this particular city that you are in. It's going to lay it all out for you, and it's going to provide you an option. It's going to take thousands of pieces of information out there and everything that it has seen you do over the last months and years, and it's going to provide you with a course of action with all of that filtered for you. It says, do you want to execute this, this uh, program? Uh, and, and you imagine the, the power of that is, the active, proactive reaching into you, knowing all of that, is different from where we stand today. But this is what... Our, our folks in our armed forces and our security forces need because of the speed of what is happening. The fact that there are so many pieces of information. There's a, there's a missile being launched over here. There's a troop movement over there. There's a ship doing something over here. Whatever is going on in thousands of places, any given person, any given decision maker, any given pilot of an aircraft has to have that relevant information filtered for them. Thousands, maybe millions of bits of information filtered in a microsecond and providing them with a course of action that they can go execute that they could never do as an individual. The human brain just can't process all that information, even if it had it to its disposal. That's the fundamentals of net-centric. That's the fundamentals of, 
uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence all protected within a cyber network. And that's what's critical and that's what's gonna be necessary to, to, um, uh, to face adversaries in the future and to ensure that, uh, that our security is protected. So those are the kind of things you're gonna see pieces of. So keep that all in context. That's what it's really all about. Next chart, please. You, you'll always hear that there's, there's three or four major pieces of all of this. In other words, that vision that you just heard, how do we, how do we make that happen? Whether it's five, 10, or 15 years from now, how do you deploy systems that operate as we describe? Well, first of all, you have to have platforms to talk to each other. We have a lot of systems that were originally built and designed with all the best of intentions to operate almost unilaterally, right? Our aircraft are deployed as aircraft. Our ships are deployed as ships. They weren't necessarily all designed for that vision that we talked about. And rightfully so, imagine, I mean, 10 years ago, we didn't have these kind of things in our pockets either. And so we're, we're looking at how do we apply that incredible new technology to, um, to our security. So we, so we gotta make those platforms interoperable. We gotta tie them together. We've gotta have networks that allow incredible information to move back and forth. And those individual nodes in that network, so that aircraft, that ship, it processes information and only sends out the information that everybody else needs to know. Because it again, each of, those, each of those products have got an incredible amount of information at their disposal. So we've got to have networks that are protected that provide that. We also got to do that then with agile business models. We've got to figure out ways to partner within companies or within countries, I should say, um, build things indigenously within country, build up economic capability uh, at the source. Uh, for if, if for no other reason to handle things like pandemics when you've got you've got um, Places around the world you're trying to bring in products and people and you can't move them freely So individual nations need to be able to operate independently. So uh, it's important that we build up capability within countries We build up the workforce we build software engineers here in the UAE, which we are doing in spades uh, that we form uh, economic capability and we build things within countries and we ought to do all that with partnerships, industrial partnerships and government partnerships with the nations that we serve. So those are some of the key elements that you're going to hear. Uh, you hear a little bit more detail again from my colleagues. Uh, let me ask you to, to flip through two, two charts just for, for timing here. Uh, Lockheed experience in the multi-domain. So with, within the U.S. governments, we have decades of experience with multi-programs. There is multiple grams with all the services within the US. And we're able to create a lot of product lines that take advantage of that experience that we had with the US government. Example, we have a product line, if you get a chance to see at our booth called Diamond Shield. It actually, it's the, one of the first product lines that integrates US assets and non-US assets. So we are not limiting how we integrate the multi-domain to only US assets. We're actually looking at um, you know, if you look at the French radars or anything from other countries, not just other companies within the U.S., but other countries, we're able to integrate that. So, which gives us advantage over a lot of other systems out there that are not able to uh, integrate non-U.S. systems. So, we actually worked with the UAE very closely uh, and other GCC nations to be able to do this. So we draw on our experience. Uh, Tim, talk about the investments, and and when we. Look at the investments in artificial intelligence and machine to machine. This is where my earlier statement that talk about make the right decision faster. The more we remove people from the loop, the more we remove humans from the loop and able to make the right decision with machine to machine and artificial intelligence, that's what enables that and, and make us make those decisions, the right decision faster. So we're investing heavily into the artificial intelligence and machine to machine. So that's one thing that we are uh, completely investing. The one thing that I wanna also talk about is the partnership that we have, not just with our customer, but the industry. So a lot of people look at the Lockheed and say, well, you're aerospace and defense. Yes, we are. However, we are really relying on the commercial industry as well to be able to bring that technology in. So when we look at the commercial industry, they're moving fast and we wanna take advantage of all of the things that they're doing. So we take that and we invest in that technology. Um, and the last thing, the last point I wanna make is uh, the partnership with the customer without the right vision from the leadership. And I, I, I wanna commend the leadership here in the UAE because they have the right vision. We cannot 
really do what we do without the right vision from the customer. So they really did put the right vision and it enables us as industry to follow their lead and follow their leadership to be able to give them the capability they need. So that was one thing that uh, I want to make sure that this is, comes across is we can do a lot of things, but without the right vision from the leadership, it really doesn't give us that opportunity to innovate. So with that, I'll give it to JR. My name is JR McDonald. I'm the Vice President for Business Development for the F-35 program. So what you're hearing is that Lockheed's investing in advancing open and connected systems. I'm going to shift to a little bit of a platform look um, as a node, the advanced node in those networks out there. From a platform perspective, step one better be that you can be interoperable in your own domain before you start worried about worrying about connecting across domains. So interoperability across your domain happens uh, in the F-35 by the fact that we've already delivered 720 F-35s around the world. In fact, by 2030, there'll be almost 500 F-35s in Europe alone. And oh, by the way, only about 50 of those will be U.S. assets. So it will be coalition and partner forces uh, spread out across Europe. 350 in the same time frame in the Pacific. And all of those airplanes are interoperable from day one. They can share information, they can pass situational awareness. Um, it's, it's built in and it happens at the very beginning of the platform. So now how do we stretch to the multi-domain piece of that? Well, we heard at the Air Chiefs Conference that the next big step and the next big hurdle that's, that's being looked at is the policy implications and the policy that must be in place so that we can share information across the domain. So the governments are looking to see what kind of data are they willing to share with everybody? And then they have to decide what format, maybe the message format, what waveform, et cetera. That's all being worked out at the government to government and service to service levels. While that happens, Lockheed Martin is not standing idly by. In fact, we've been investing and experimenting and demonstrating our ability to reach out across the domains for quite some time. We demonstrate our ability to connect to the sea in 2016 when we worked with our Naval Integrated Fire Control groups and, and connected an F-35 flying using its sensor to provide targeting information to an Aegis cruiser and strike with live fire an incoming target. Then we connected to the ground domain with the United States Marine Corps and we used an F-35 to sense a target that was beyond the ability of the HIMARS battery to see, pass that information to HIMARS, and they were able to strike that target. And then for good measure from the ground domain, we wanted to see if it worked the other way. And in 2020, at, uh, at the um, Orange Flag exercise, we actually took targeting data from the Army back up to the F-35, and then we used the F-35 weapons to provide effect. So the opposite direction, we did that. And then just recently, um, this past year, we had F-35s flying in Texas, providing real-time data from their sensors to Australia. So around the world, we're providing real-time data that the f 35 seen back to the Australian Defense Forces. And we continue to do these demonstrations in all the domains, including space, and it's, it's been very successful for us. <clears throat> As we modernize the airplane, this ability to be an advanced sensor gets better and better. In fact, with our Block 4 capability that's coming on board right now, um, there are 75 major upgrades coming to the airplane, and most of those directly affect our, our multi-domain operations capabilities. I would characterize it three ways in those multiple um, upgrades that we're doing. Number one, we're improving the organic sensors on the airplane. Um, the computing power that's going in this upgrade allows us to use AI along with the sensors to have cognitive EW, so the EW is learning as it goes. Number two, our weapons capacity and capability improves. And then number three, all of that networking that we've been talking about, that communications piece of it, we have increased flexibility and increased security of our networks to include the online of site communications, which is hugely important. So, F-35 should be a part of any network out there. 
And I think it's important to recognize that that means um, whether it's a, a JAD C2 joint all domain command and control that, that the US Air Force and others are looking at, or even an FCAS, um, F-35 is an important node in any network out there. And, and F-35 will bring power to those networks. So looking back at it, what does F-35 bring as that advanced node? Well, you've got a, you've got a stealthy airplane that can self-protect and penetrate into densely defended environments. It can use incredible organic sensors that look across the electromagnetic spectrum to locate and characterize targets. It can then decide if it wants to attack those targets kinetically or non-kinetically with electronic attack, or it can just take all of that information and pass it to everybody else in the battle space over the network so that everybody is situationally aware. So with those considerations, I think that uh, most of you will agree that, that F-35 should be an important element of any network out there for coalition operations. And with that, I'll pass it over to Scott. Thank you. Thank you. I'm the Vice President of Integrated Air and Missile Defense, or IAMD. I'm gonna spend a few minutes talking to you about what joint all domain operations looks like in the IAMD mission space and I'll give you um, a few examples. So the idea, the future of, of um, IAMD is to leverage the command and control systems and the networks you heard my colleagues talk about to link any sensor or the best sensor with any shooter or the best shooter. Um, and I'll take you through a few examples um, where we're actually uh, been doing that. Uh, so we had a, a flight test uh, this, this year uh, where we demonstrated the ability for the F-35 to track a cruise missile, real-time download that track information to a ground-based air defense system, and launch a Pac-3 interceptor and uh, defeat that target and intercept the cruise missile. Uh, we also had a, a recent test that we did uh, as part of a U.S. Army uh, Project Convergence where we demonstrated the ability, again, to take that F-35 track down to a ground-based system and demonstrated the ability for, through a simulated environment, for the HIMARS to actually uh, engage a moving target with real-time tracks downloaded from uh, the F-35. So a few more examples of the capabilities that you heard uh, JR talk about. Another one that we uh, tested last year uh, is we integrated PAC-3 with the THAAD system, or the Terminal High Altitude Air Defense System, in a flight test, we demonstrated the ability for the THAAD radar to acquire long-range ballistic missile targets and, again, real-time provide that track information to a PAC-3 unit, uh, which engaged the TBM at a longer range than it's ever been able to do using its organic sensor. So, again, we're, we're showing examples where we're taking the best sensors, integrating those with the best interceptors, and showing that we can expand the operational battle space for our customers to enable their defense. So hopefully today we, we gave you an idea of not only what our vision is um, for network-centric uh, uh, defense, but also some specific examples of how we're progressing that for our customers. With that, I think we're ready to open up for questions. Uh, my question is to Jia. Uh, when you said that you know when the F-35 goes back to all parts of the formation and information goes everywhere, so does it mean all parts of the Air Force formations from its flying like big squadron, the commander comes to know and everybody, so I just wanted to understand what that meant. So, so that's part of that policy piece that the governments are gonna decide as to where the communication flows and how much of it goes to where. That what we have though is the ability, once the policy is in place, to push the information wherever the commander wants it to go. So routing it uh, through flights or through other systems, as we mentioned, you'll get the right information to the right person on the battlefield as they need it. You can't give all the information to everybody all the time because you can't consume it. Um, they're, so they're part of the system um, for the, the multi-domain operation will decide how you parse the information to the, the person that needs it. Um, the F-35 piece of it is it had every bit of information it has, it can pass to wherever in the system it needs to go. So how it goes is, is part of the system, not the F-35. So is there also a concept that the reverse flow of information happens? 
the pilot is in a situation and it needs to go back to the squadron commander or whoever, there are various formations. So there is there a reverse flow of information also which can happen here? Yeah, and so again, the beauty of the F-35 is that information flow is happening all the time. And through sensor fusion, um, that information is collated. You, you may have the same target data coming from seven different sources. And from a pilot's point of view in the airplane, it doesn't matter where the data came from, it's just going to be presented to them as data. So the, the fusion that's happening inside the airplane is taking multiple sources of information, correlating that, and then giving it to the pilot as he needs it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. First, uh, in a recent interview with His Excellency Faisal al Banai, uh, CEO of Edge, um, he mentioned two interesting points. The first is that if Edge projects five to 10 years from now, their vision is artificial intelligence, electronic warfare, and autonomous, which is very similar also to your vision. And my question here is, where do you see more potential in these areas to cooperate with the UAE or perhaps many other countries in the GCC? Um, is there anything happening now? Um, any like updates on, these, on this first? Second, the types of threats are evolving. <laughs> so the threats of today are not like the threats 10 years from now. Where do you stand as well as Lockheed Martin in terms of this specific vision? So um, let, let me talk a little bit about, uh, take your questions in order. Um, relative to uh, the, the workforce within the UAE, yeah, absolutely it, it is our vision to, um, to uh, have them an integral part of what we are going to do. And, and for example, uh, we have a, uh, a um, center right, near, right here, and I always give the acronym, right? It's CSSI, and, and it's the Center for Security and- Innovation and Security uh, Solutions. Yeah, it's a, CISS. CISS, sorry. And it is, it is our, uh, what's important about it is that um, this is where we have bring, been bringing UAE interns in now for a number of years. We have about 100 UAE interns that have gone through this center. And uh, we, they, they learn software skills, they are growing on the skills that they are receiving within, within their universities. And then uh, they're becoming part of the Lockheed Martin network and they're actually contributing by building systems that, that we are, are actually deploying and, and using, for example, on our F-35 line. There's a, there's a little sensor bot that they've built that, that's, that's um, already, already being used operationally. Uh, but fundamentally going forward, the intent is to continue to build that, that software capability within the UAE, to partner with Edge, to partner with other companies within the UAE and within the region, whatever country that we're operating in, to do just that. So our intention is, for example, um, what JR described for, for networking the F-35 together, much of that work we would envision for the UAE happening within the UAE. And this is certainly one of the skills, quite honestly, as a, as a I'm not a software engineer, but I'm a father of a, of a software engineer. Um, I can tell you that this is the one skill that we can rapidly build up capability quickly. Um, it doesn't require a lot of, a lot of you know, it doesn't require um, metal bending and it doesn't require 20 years of, of, of apprenticeship to learn the skill. We, you know, you, you quickly build up that capability and our intention is to do just that. So I think um, you, you're gonna see increasing partnerships. You saw a memorandum of understanding we signed with Edge yesterday. You're gonna see more of those kind of things in a lot of, of high technology areas. Um, I guess I, I can briefly address the the, um, the threat uh, question, and then I'll see if any of my colleagues want to jump in. We absolutely look forward to where where the the threats are going, and a significant portion of our business is all about predicting, in conjunction with individual governments, and looking at, at classified and unclassified data with our individual uh, nations that we serve, uh, to predict what they're going to do next. And so that is all part of the calculus because oftentimes for research and development, we have to look two, three, five, maybe even seven years down the line. What are not just the new technologies, but what's the new science that, that are behind those technologies? And we'll do that in all the countries that we are in. And this is why things such as uh, the CIS is so important to, to catch um, uh, young folks that are just emerging into the, into the business and to bring their, their young minds to bear looking to where we're going. So that's very, very important for us. Does any, anybody want to add anything on that? So, uh, which are the other countries in which you think that the Lockheed Martin effort is a little less and you, you, there's scope to improve it and get new customers? Also, that what is the sort of MRO activity within the region 
for uh, the customers here. I mean, we don't have to, you have to take it back to US every time if there's an, uh, you know, what sort of checks, because it's military, so definitely we'd like to understand what are the plans you have for that, or which existing plans also. So, um, so in terms of other countries, so, uh, you know, a few of us here had the opportunity, I think, I think GR mentioned it, to sit through the Air Chiefs Conference uh, here in, uh, last Saturday, um, right here in Dubai. Um, you heard the exact same themes that we're talking about coming from Air Chief after Air Chief that were standing up. So you could, you can imagine without over-exaggerating it, all of the allied nations that are, that are, um, uh, that are aligned that you would see at that conference from everybody from you saw them from from the Middle East of course you saw them from Europe from India from all through Asia Australia um, and the United States of course all, all countries are looking at the same type of things how are we going to respond to a an evolving threat a serious evolving threat in a whole series of domains and the answer comes back to the same thing is taking our systems and applying them uh, in, a, in a holistic manner in an integrated in a network manner and so when I say all countries, it's, it is literally, if, if they're allied, you know, in any way with, uh, shall I say, with the United States and all the, and all the allies that were at the Air Chief Conference, um, they're, they're places that we're talking to, to folks. Um, yeah, the sustainment, uh, the sustainment system for the F-35 is, is a global sustainment system. So um, there, there's no planned depot maintenance level for the airplane. It's, it's a, um, a, a maintenance as it's required, uh, and and there's, I'm not exactly sure specific in the region exactly what we've got aligned. I, we are working through that. I just don't have it uh, at the at the tip of my fingers right now, so I have to get back to you on it. I apologize. That's fine.